is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 18. Miss Ophelia's Experiences and Opinions. Our friend Tom, in his own simple musings, often compared his more fortunate lot, in the bondage into which he was cast, with that of Joseph in Egypt. And, in fact, as time went on, and he developed more and more under the eye of his master, the strength of the parallel increased. St. Clair was indolent and careless of money. Hitherto the providing and marketing had been principally done by Adolf, who was, to the full, as careless and extravagant as his master and between them both they had carried on the dispersing process with great alacrity. Accustomed for many years to regard his master's property as his own care, Tom saw, with an uneasiness he could scarcely repress, the wasteful expenditure of the establishment, and, in the quiet, indirect way which his class often acquire, would sometimes make his own suggestions. St. Clair at first employed him occasionally but, struck with his soundness of mind and good business capacity, he confided in him more and more, till gradually all the marketing and providing for the family were entrusted to him. "'No, no, Adolf,' he said one day, as Adolf was deprecating the passing of power out of his hands, "'let Tom alone. You only understand what you want. Tom understands cost and come to and there may be some end to money by and by if we don't let somebody do that trusted to an unlimited extent by a careless master who handed him a bill without looking at it and pocketed the change without counting it tom had every facility and temptation to dishonesty and nothing but an impregnable simplicity of nature strengthened by christian faith could have kept him from it but to that nature the very unbounded trust reposed in him was bond and seal for the most scrupulous accuracy. With Adolf the case had been different. Thoughtless and self-indulgent, and unrestrained by a master who found it easier to indulge than to regulate, he had fallen into an absolute confusion as to meum tuum with regard to himself and his master, which sometimes troubled even St. Clair. His own good sense taught him that such a training of his servants was unjust and dangerous. A sort of chronic remorse went with him everywhere, although not strong enough to make any decided change in his course. And this very remorse reacted again into indulgence. He passed lightly over the most serious faults, because he told himself that, if he had done his part, his dependents had not fallen into them. Tom regarded his gay, airy, handsome young master with an odd mixture of fealty, reverence, and fatherly solicitude that he never read the Bible, never went to church, that he jested and made free with any and everything that came in the way of his wits, that he spent his Sunday evenings at the opera or theatre, that he went to wine-parties and clubs and suppers oftener than was at all expedient, were all things that Tom could see as plainly as anybody, and on which he based a conviction that Massa wasn't a Christian, a conviction, however, which he would have been very slow to express to any one else, but on which he founded many prayers, in his own simple fashion, when he was by himself in his little dormitory. Not that Tom had not his own way of speaking his mind occasionally, with something of the tact often observable in his class. As, for example, the very day after the Sabbath we have described, St. Clair was invited out to a convivial party of choice spirits, and was helped home, between one and two o'clock at night, in a condition when the physical had decidedly attained the upper hand of the intellectual. Tom and Adolph assisted to get him composed for the night, the latter in high spirits evidently regarding the matter as a good joke, and laughing heartily at the rusticity of Tom's horror, who really was simple enough to lie awake most of the rest of the night praying for his young master. "'Well, Tom, what are you waiting for?' said St. Clair the next day, as he sat in his library in dressing-gown and slippers. St. Clair had just been entrusting Tom with some money and various commissions. "'Isn't all right there, Tom?' he added, as Tom still stood waiting. "'I'm afraid not, Massa,' said Tom, with a grave voice. St. Clair laid down his paper, and set down his coffee-cup, and looked at Tom. "'Why, Tom, what's the case? You look as solemn as a coffin.' 
I feel very bad, Massa. I always have thought that Massa would be good to everybody. Well, Tom, haven't I been? Come now, what do you want? There's something you haven't got, I suppose, and this is the preface. Massa always been good to me. I haven't nothing to complain of on that head, but there is one that Massa isn't good to. Why, Tom, what's got into you? Speak out. What do you mean? Last night, between one and two, I thought so. I studied upon the matter, then. Massa isn't good to himself. Tom said this with his back to his master and his hand on the doorknob. St. Clair felt his face flush crimson, but he laughed. "'Oh, that's all, is it?' he said gaily. "'All!' said Tom, turning suddenly round and falling on his knees. "'Oh, my dear young master, I'm afraid it will be loss of all, all, body and soul. The good book says, It biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder, my dear master. Tom's voice choked, and the tears ran down his cheeks. "'You poor silly fools,' said St. Clair, with tears in his own eyes. "'Get up, Tom. I'm not worth crying over.' But Tom wouldn't rise, and looked imploringly. "'Well, I won't go to any more of their cursed nonsense, Tom,' said St. Clair. "'On my honor, I won't. I don't know why I haven't stopped long ago. I've always despised it, and myself for it. So, now, Tom, wipe up your eyes, and go about your errands. Come, come, he added. No blessings. I'm not so wonderfully good now, he said, as he gently pushed Tom to the door. There, I'll pledge my honor to you, Tom. You don't see me so again, he said. And Tom went off, wiping his eyes with great satisfaction. I'll keep my faith with him, too, said St. Clair, as he closed the door. And St. Clair did so for gross sensualism in any form was not the peculiar temptation of his nature. But all this time who shall detail the tribulations manifold of our friend Miss Ophelia, who had begun the labors of a southern housekeeper? There is all the difference in the world in the servants of southern establishments, according to the character and capacity of the mistresses who have brought them up. South, as well as North, there are women who have an extraordinary talent for command, and tact in educating. Such are enabled, with apparent ease, and without severity, to subject to their will, and bring into harmonious and systematic order, the various members of their small estate, to regulate their peculiarities, and to balance and compensate the deficiencies of one by the excess of another, as to produce a harmonious and orderly system. Such a housekeeper was Mrs. Shelby, whom we have already described, and such our readers may remember to have met with. If they are not common at the South, it is because they are not common in the world. They are to be found there as often as anywhere, and, when existing, find in that peculiar state of society a brilliant opportunity to exhibit their domestic talent. Such a housekeeper Marie St. Clair was not, nor her mother before her, Indolent and childish, unsystematic and improvident, it was not to be expected that servants trained under her care should not be so likewise, and she had very justly described to Miss Ophelia the state of confusion she would find in the family, though she had not ascribed it to the proper cause. The first morning of her regency Miss Ophelia was up at four o'clock, and having attended to all the adjustments of her own chamber, as she had done ever since she came there, to the great amazement of the chambermaid, she prepared for a vigorous onslaught on the cupboards and closets of the establishment of which she had the keys. The storeroom, the linen presses, the china closet, the kitchen and the cellar, that day all went under an awful review. Hidden things of darkness were brought to light to an extent that alarmed all the principalities and powers of kitchen and chamber, and caused many wonderings and murmurings about, "'These yer northern ladies!' from the domestic cabinet. Old Dinah, the head cook, and principal of all rule and authority in the kitchen department, was filled with wrath at what she considered an invasion of privilege. No feudal baron in Magna Carta times could have more thoroughly resented some incursion of the crown. Dinah was a character in her own way, and it would be injustice to her memory not to give the reader a little idea of her. She was a native and essential cook, as much as Aunt Chloe, cooking being an indigenous talent of the African race. 
but Chloe was a trained and methodical one who moved in an orderly domestic harness, while Dinah was a self-taught genius, and, like geniuses in general, was positive, opinionated, and erratic to the last degree. Like a certain class of modern philosophers, Dinah perfectly scorned logic and reason in every shape, and always took refuge in intuitive certainty, and here she was perfectly impregnable. No possible amount of talent, or authority, or explanation could ever make her believe that any other way was better than her own, or that the course she had pursued in the smallest matter could be in the least modified. This had been a conceded point with her old mistress, Marie's mother, and Miss Marie, as Dinah always called her young mistress, even after her marriage, found it easier to submit than contend, and so Dinah had ruled supreme. This was the easier in that she was perfect mistress of that diplomatic art which unites the utmost subservience of manner with the utmost inflexibility as to measure. Dinah was mistress of the whole art and mystery of excuse-making, in all its branches. Indeed, it was an axiom with her that the cook can do no wrong, and a cook in a southern kitchen finds abundance of heads and shoulders on which to lay off every sin and frailty, so as to maintain her own immaculateness entire. If any part of the dinner was a failure, there were fifty indisputably good reasons for it, and it was the fault undeniably of fifty other people, whom Dinah berated with unsparing zeal. But it was very seldom that there was any failure in Dinah's last results. Though her mode of doing everything was peculiarly meandering and circuitous, and without any sort of calculation as to time and place, though her kitchen generally looked as if it had been arranged by a hurricane blowing through it, and she had about as many places for each cooking utensil as there were days in the year, yet, if one would have patience to wait her own good time, up would come her dinner in perfect order, and in a style of preparation with which an epicure could find no fault. It was now the season of incipient preparation for dinner. Dinah, who required large intervals of reflection and repose, and was studious of ease in all her arrangements, was seated on the kitchen floor, smoking a short stumpy pipe, to which she was much addicted, and which she always kindled up as a sort of censer whenever she felt the need of an inspiration in her arrangements. It was Dinah's mode of invoking the domestic muses. Seated around her were various members of that rising race with which a southern household abounds, engaged in shelling peas, peeling potatoes, picking pin-feathers out of fowls, and other preparatory arrangements, Dinah every once in a while interrupting her meditations to give a poke, or a rap on the head, to some of the young operators, with a pudding-stick that lay by her side. In fact, Dinah ruled over the woolly heads of the younger members with a rod of iron, and seemed to consider them born for no earthly purpose but to save her steps, as she phrased it. It was the spirit of the system under which she had grown up, and she carried it out to its full extent. Miss Ophelia, after passing on her reformatory tour through all the other parts of the establishment, now entered the kitchen. Dinah had heard from various sources what was going on, and resolved to stand on defensive and conservative ground, mentally determined to oppose and ignore every new measure without any actual observable contest. The kitchen was a large brick-floored apartment, with a great old-fashioned fireplace stretching along one side of it, an arrangement which St. Clair had vainly tried to persuade Dinah to exchange for the convenience of a modern cook-stove. Not she! No Puseyite, note, Edward Bouverie Pusey, 1800 to 1888, champion of the orthodoxy of revealed religion, defender of the Oxford movement, and requius professor of Hebrew and canon of Christ Church, Oxford. Not she, no Puseyite, or conservative of any school, was ever more inflexibly attached to time-honored inconveniences than Dinah. When St. Clair had first returned from the North, impressed with the system and order of his uncle's kitchen arrangements, he had largely provided his own with an array of cupboards, drawers, and various apparatus to induce systematic regulation, under the sanguine illusion that it would be of any possible assistance to Dinah in her arrangements. He might as well have provided them for a squirrel or a magpie. The more drawers and closets there were, 
the more hiding-holes could Dinah make for the accommodation of old rags, hair-combs, old shoes, ribbons, cast-off artificial flowers, and other articles of vertu wherein her soul delighted. When Miss Ophelia entered the kitchen, Dinah did not rise, but smoked on in sublime tranquillity, regarding her movements obliquely out of the corner of her eye, but apparently intent only on the operations around her. Miss Ophelia commenced opening a set of drawers. "'What is this drawer for, Dinah?' she said. "'It's handy for most anything, missus,' said Dinah. So it appeared to be. From the variety it contained, Miss Ophelia pulled out first a fine damask tablecloth stained with blood, having evidently been used to envelop some raw meat. "'What's this, Dinah? You don't wrap up meat in your mistress's best tablecloths?' "'Oh, Lord, missus, no! The towels was all a-missin', so I just did it. I laid out to wash that, uh, that's why I put it thar. Shiftless, said Miss Ophelia to herself, proceeding to tumble over the drawer, where she found a nutmeg grater and two or three nutmegs, a Methodist hymn-book, a couple of soiled madras handkerchiefs, some yarn and knitting-work, a paper of tobacco and a pipe, a few crackers, one or two gilded china saucers with some pomade in them, one or two thin old shoes, a piece of flannel carefully pinned up enclosing some small white onions, several damask table-napkins, some coarse crash-towels, some twine and darning-needles, and several broken papers, from which sundry sweet herbs were sifting into the drawer. "'Where do you keep your nutmegs, Dinah?' said Miss Ophelia, with the air of one who prayed for patience. "'Most anywhere, missus. There's some in that cracked teacup up there, and there's some over in that ar cupboard.' "'Here are some in the grater,' said Miss Ophelia, holding them up. "'Laws, yes, I put them there this morning. I likes to keep my things handy,' said Dinah. "'You, Jake, what are you stopping for? You'll catch it. Be still there,' she added with a dive of her stick at the criminal. "'What's this?' said Miss Ophelia, holding up the saucer of pomade. "'Law, no, it's my grease. I put it thar to have it handy. Do you use your mistress's best saucers for that? Law, no, it was cause I was driv in such a hurry. I was gwine to change it this very day. Here are two damask table napkins. Them table napkins I put thar to get em washed out some day. Don't you have some place here on purpose for things to be washed?' "'Well, Massa St. Clair got dat our chest,' he said, for dat. "'But I likes to mix up biscuits and have my things on it some days. And then it ain't handy a liftin' up the lid.' "'Why don't you mix your biscuits on the pastry-table there?' "'Lo, miss, it gets sot so full of dishes, and, and one thing another, and there ain't no room no way. "'But you should wash your dishes and clear them away.' "'Wash my dishes!' said Tina, in a high key, as her wrath began to rise over her habitual respect of manner. "'What does ladies know about work, I want to know? When'd master ever get his dinner, if I was to spend all my time a-washin' and puttin' up dishes? Miss Marie never telled me so, no how. "'Well, here are these onions.' "'Laws, yes,' said Dinah. "'There is where I put em now. I couldn't remember. Them's particular onions I was a-savin' for dis yar very stew. I had forgot they was in dat our old flannel. Miss Ophelia lifted out the sifting papers of sweet herbs. I wish missus wouldn't touch dem ar. I likes to keep my things where I knows where to go to em, said Dinah rather decidedly. But you don't want these holes in the papers. Dem's handy for siftin' on out, said Dinah. But you see it spills all over the drawer. "'Laws, yes. If missus will go a-tumblin' things all up so, it will. Missus has spilt lots dat our way,' said Dinah, coming uneasily to the drawers. "'If missus only will go upstairs till my clarin' up time comes, I'll have everything right. But I can't do nothin' when ladies is round a-hinderin'. "'You, Sam, don't you give the baby dat our sugar bowl. I'll crack you over if you don't mind.' I'm going through the kitchen, and going to put everything in order once, Dinah, and then I'll expect you to keep it so. Lor, now, Miss Velia, dat ar ain't no way for ladies to do. I never did see ladies doin' no sich. My old missus, uh, nor Miss Marie, never did, and I don't see no kinder need on it. 
and Dinah stalked indignantly about while Miss Ophelia piled and sorted dishes, emptied dozens of scattering bowls of sugar into one receptacle, sorted napkins, tablecloths, and towels for washing, washing, wiping, and arranging with her own hands, and with a speed and alacrity which perfectly amazed Dinah. "'Lord, now, if dat are de way dem northern ladies do, dey ain't ladies know-how,' she said to some of her satellites, when at a safe hearing distance. "'I has things as straight as anybody, when my clarin' up times comes. But I don't want ladies round a handerin' and gettin' my things all where I can't find em. To do Dinah justice, she had, at irregular periods, paroxysms of reformation and arrangement, which she called clarin' up times, when she would begin with great zeal, and turn every drawer and closet wrong side outward, on to the floor or tables, and make the ordinary confusion sevenfold more confounded. Then she would light her pipe, and leisurely go over her arrangements, looking things over, and discoursing upon them making all the young fry scour most vigorously on the tin things, and keeping up for several hours a most energetic state of confusion, which she would explain to the satisfaction of all inquirers by the remark that she was a clarin' up. She couldn't have things a gwine on so as they had been, and she was gwine to make these yar young ones keep better order, for Dinah herself somehow indulged the illusion that she, herself, was the soul of order and it was only the young uns and the everybody else in the house that were the cause of anything that fell short of perfection in this respect. When all the tins were scoured, and the tables scrubbed snowy white, and everything that could offend tucked out of sight in holes and corners, Dinah would dress herself up in a smart dress, clean apron, and high, brilliant madras turban, and tell all marauding young uns to keep out of the kitchen, for she was glad to have things kept nice. Indeed, these periodic seasons were often an inconvenience to the whole household, for Dinah would contract such an immoderate attachment to her scoured tin as to insist upon it that it shouldn't be used again for any possible purpose, at least till the ardor of the clarin' up period abated. Miss Ophelia, in a few days, thoroughly reformed every department of the house to a systematic pattern but her labors in all departments that depended on the cooperation of servants were like those of Sisyphus or Deniades. In despair she one day appealed to St. Clair, "'There is no such thing as getting anything like a system in this family.' "'To be sure there isn't,' said St. Clair. "'Such shiftless management, such waste, such confusion, I never saw.' "'I dare say you didn't. You would not take it so coolly if you were housekeeper.' "'My dear cousin, you may as well understand, once for all, that we masters are divided into two classes, oppressors and oppressed. We who are good-natured and hate severity make up our minds to a good deal of inconvenience. If we will keep a shambling, loose, untaught set in the community for our convenience, why, we must take the consequence. Some rare cases I have seen of persons who, by a peculiar tact, can produce order and system without severity. But I'm not one of them, and so I made up my mind long ago to let things go just as they do. I will not have the poor devils thrashed and cut to pieces, and they know it, and of course they know the staff is in their own hands. But to have no time, no place, no order, all going on in this shiftless way— my dear Vermont, you natives up by the North Pole set an extravagant value on time. What on earth is the use of time to a fellow who has twice as much of it as he knows what to do with? As to order and system, where there is nothing to be done but to lounge on the sofa and read, an hour sooner or later in breakfast or dinner isn't of much account. Now, there's Dinah gets you a capital dinner, soup, ragout, roast fowl, dessert, ice-creams and all, and she creates it all out of chaos, and old night down there in that kitchen. I think it really sublime the way she manages. But heaven bless us, if we are to go down there and view all the smoking and squatting about, and hurry scurriation of the preparatory process, we should never eat more. My good cousin, absolve yourself from that. It's more than a Catholic penance, and does no more good. You'll only lose your own temper and utterly confound Dinah. Let her go her own way. But, Augustine, you don't know how I found things. Don't I? 
Don't I know that the rolling pin is under her bed, and the nutmeg grater in her pocket with her tobacco? That there are sixty-five different sugar-bowls, one in every hole in the house? That she washes dishes with a dinner-napkin one day, and with a fragment of an old petticoat the next? But the upshot is, she gets up glorious dinners, makes superb coffee, and you must judge her as warriors and statesmen are judged, by her success. But the waste, the expense! Oh, well, lock everything you can, and keep the keys, give out by driblets, and never inquire for odds and ends. It isn't best. That troubles me, Augustine. I can't help feeling as if these servants were not strictly honest. Are you sure they can be relied on? Augustine laughed immoderately at the grave and anxious face with which Miss Ophelia propounded the question. "'Oh, cousin, that's too good. Honest? <laughs> as if that's a thing to be expected. Honest? Why, of course they aren't. Why should they be? What upon earth is to make them so? Why don't you instruct?' "'Instruct? Oh, fiddlestick! What instructing do you think I should do? I look like it. As to Marie, she has spirit enough, to be sure, to kill off a whole plantation, if I'd let her manage. But she wouldn't get the cheatery out of them.' Are there no honest ones? Well, now and then one, whom nature makes so impractically simple, truthful, and faithful, that the worst possible influence can't destroy it. But you see, from the mother's breast, the colored child feels and sees that there are none but underhand ways open to it. It can get along no other way with its parents, its mistress, its young master and missy playfellows. Cunning and deception become necessary, inevitable habits. It isn't fair to expect anything else of him. He ought not to be punished for it. As to honesty, the slave is kept in that dependent, semi-childish state that there is no making him realize the rights of property, or feel that his master's goods are not his own, if he can get them. For my part, I don't see how they can be honest. Such a fellow as Tom here is, is a moral miracle. "'And what becomes of their souls?' said Miss Ophelia. "'That isn't my affair, as I know of,' said St. Clair. "'I am only dealing in facts of the present life. The fact is that the whole race are pretty generally understood to be turned over to the devil for our benefit in this world, however it may turn out in another.' "'This is perfectly horrible,' said Miss Ophelia. "'You ought to be ashamed of yourselves.' "'I don't know as I am. We are in pretty good company for all that," said St. Clair, as people in the broad road generally are. Look at the high and the low, all the world over, and it's the same story. The lower class used up body, soul, and spirit for the good of the upper. It is so in England, it is so everywhere, and yet all Christendom stands aghast with virtuous indignation, because we do the thing in a little different shape from what they do it. It isn't so in Vermont. Ah, well, in New England, and in the free states, you have the better of us, I grant. But uh, there's the bell, so, cousin, let us for a while lay aside our sectional prejudices, and come out to dinner." As Miss Ophelia was in the kitchen, in the latter part of the afternoon, some of the sable children called out, "'La sakes! Dies Prue a-comin', grantin' along, like she allers does!' A tall, bony-coloured woman now entered the kitchen bearing on her head a basket of rusks and hot rolls. "'How, oh, Prue, you come,' said Dinah. Prue had a peculiar scowling expression of countenance, and a sullen, grumbling voice. She set down her basket, squatted herself down, and, resting her elbows on her knees, said, "'Oh, Lord, I wished I was dead!' "'Why do you wish you were dead?' said Miss Ophelia. "'I'd be out of my misery,' said the woman gruffly, without taking her eyes from the floor. "'What need you getting drunk, then, and cutting up, Prue?' said a spruce quadroon chambermaid, dangling as she spoke a pair of coral eardrops. The woman looked at her with a sour, surly glance. "'Maybe you'll come to it one of these yardays. I'd be glad to see you, I would. Then you'll be glad of a drop like me to forget your misery.' "'Come, Prue,' said Dinah. "'Let's look at your rusks. Here's Mrs. will pay for them.' Miss Ophelia took out a couple of dozen. "'There's some tickets in that our old crack jug on the top shelf,' said Dinah. "'You, Jake, climb up and get it down.' 
"'Tickets? What are they for?' said Miss Ophelia. "'We buy tickets of her massa, and she gives us bread for em. "'And they counts my money and tickets when I gets home, to see if I's got the change. "'And if I hadn't, uh, they half kills me.' "'And serves you right,' said Jane, the pert chambermaid. "'If you will take their money to get drunk on, that's what she does, missus. "'And that's what I will do. I can't live no other ways. Drink and forget my misery.' "'You are very wicked and very foolish,' said Miss Ophelia, "'to steal your master's money to make yourself a brute with.' "'It's mighty likely, missus, but I will do it. Yes, I will, O oh Lord. I wish I's dead, I do. I wish I's dead and out of my misery.' And slowly and stiffly the old creature rose and got her basket on her head again, and before she went out she looked at the quadroon girl, who still stood playing with her eardrops. Ye think you're mighty fine with them are a frolicking and a tossin' your head and a lookin' down on everybody. Well, never mind. You may live to be a poor old cut up critter like me. Hope to Lord you will, I do. Then see if you won't drink. Drink. Drink yourself into torment, and sarve your right to a uh. and with a malignant howl the woman left the room. "'Disgustin' old beast,' said Adolph, who was getting his master's shaving-water. "'If I was her master, I'd cut her up worse than she is.' "'He couldn't do that, are no way,' said Dinah. "'Her back's a far sight now. She can't never get a dress together over it.' "'I think such low creatures ought not to be allowed to go round to genteel families,' said Miss Jane. "'What do you think, Miss St. Clair?' she said, coquettishly tossing her head at Adolph. It must be observed that, among other appropriations from his master's stock, Adolph was in the habit of adopting his name and address, and that the style under which he moved among the colored circles of New Orleans was that of Mr. St. Clair. "'I'm certainly of your opinion, Miss Benoit,' said Adolph. Benoit was the name of Marie St. Clair's family, and Jane was one of her servants. "'Pray, Miss Benoit, may I be allowed to ask if those drops are for the ball to-morrow night? They are certainly bewitching.' "'I wonder now, Mr. St. Clair, what the impudence of you men will come to,' said Jane, tossing her pretty head till the eardrops twinkled again. "'I shan't dance with you for a whole evening, if you go to asking me any more questions.' "'Oh, you couldn't be so cruel now.' "'I was just dying to know whether you would appear in your pink tarlatan,' said Adolph. "'What is it?' said Rosa, a bright, piquant little quadroon, who came skipping downstairs at this moment. "'Why, Mr. St. Clair is so impudent!' "'On my honor," said Adolph, "'I'll leave it to Miss Rosa now.' "'I know he's always a saucy creature,' said Rosa, poising herself on one of her little feet, and looking maliciously at Adolph. He's always getting me so angry with him. Oh, ladies, ladies, you will certainly break my heart between you, said Adolph. I shall be found dead in my bed some morning, and you'll have it to answer for. Do we hear the horrid creature talk? said both ladies, laughing immoderately. Come, clear out, you. I can't have you cluttering up the kitchen, said Dinah, in my way fooling round here. And Dinah's glum because she can't go to the ball, said Rosa. "'Don't want none of your light-colored balls,' said Dinah. "'Cuttin' round, makin' believe you's white folks. After all, you's niggers much as I am.' "'Aunt Dinah greases her wool stiff every day to make it lie straight,' said Jane. "'It will be wool, after all,' said Rosa, maliciously shaking down her long, silky curls. "'Well, in the Lord's sight, ain't wool as good as bar any time,' said Dinah. "'I'd like to have Mrs. say which is worth the most.' A couple such as you, or one like me. Get out with you, you trumpery. I won't have you round. Here the conversation was interrupted in a twofold manner. St. Clair's voice was heard at the head of the stairs, asking Adolph if he meant to stay all night with his shaving water, and Miss Ophelia, coming out of the dining room, said, Jane and Rosa, what are you wasting your time for here? Go in and attend to your muslins. Our friend Tom, who had been in the kitchen during the conversation with the old Rusk woman, had followed her out into the street. He saw her go on, giving every once in a while a suppressed groan. At last she set her basket down on a doorstep, and began arranging the old faded shawl which covered her shoulders. "'I'll carry your basket a piece,' said Tom compassionately. "'Why should ye?' said the woman. "'I don't want no help.' 
"'You seem to be sick, or in trouble, or something,' said Tom. "'I ain't sick,' said the woman shortly. "'I wish,' said Tom, looking at her earnestly, "'I wish I could persuade you to leave off drinking. Don't you know it will be the ruin of you, body and soul?' "'I knows I'm going to torment,' said the woman sullenly. "'You don't need to tell me that, our eyes ugly, eyes wicked, eyes gwine straight to torment. Oh, Lord, I wished eyes are!' Tom shuddered at these frightful words, spoken with a sullen, impassioned earnestness. "'Oh, Lord, have mercy on you, poor critter. Han't ye never heard of Jesus Christ?' "'Jesus Christ? Who's he?' "'Why, he's the Lord,' said Tom. "'I think I've heard tell o' the Lord, and the judgment and torment. I heard that. But didn't anybody ever tell you of the Lord Jesus that loved us poor sinners, and died for us?" "'Don't know nothing about that,' said the woman. "'Nobody had not never loved me since my old man died.' "'Where was you raised?' said Tom. "'Up in Kentuck. A man kept me to breed chillin' for market, and sold em as fast as they got big enough. Last of all he sold me to a speculator, and my master got me o' him. What set you into this bad way of drinking?' "'To shit out my misery.' I had one child after I come here, and I thought that I'd have one to raise, cause Massa wasn't a speculator. It was the peartest little thing, and Missus she seemed to think a heap on't at first. It never cried. It was likely and fat, but Missus tuck sick, and I tended her, and I took the fever, and my milk all left me, and the child it pined to skin and bone, and Missus wouldn't buy milk for it. She wouldn't hear to me when I told her I hadn't milk. She said she knowed I could feed it on what other folks eat, and the child kinder pined and cried and cried and cried day and night, and got all gone to skin and bones, and Missus got sot again it, and she said twas nothing but crossness. She wished it was dead, she said, and she wouldn't let me have it o' nights, cause she said it kept me awake and made me good for nothing. She made me sleep in her room, and I had to put it away off in a little kind of garret, and thar it cried itself to death one night. It did, and I tuck to drinkin' to keep its cryin' out of my ears, I did. And I will drink. I will, if I do go to torment for it. Master says I shall go to torment, and I tell him I've got thar now." "'Oh, ye poor critter,' said Tom. Hadn't nobody never told you how the Lord Jesus loved you and died for you? Hadn't they told you that He'll help you, and ye can go to heaven and have rest at last? I looks like gwine to heaven, said the woman. Ain't thar where white folks is gwine? Suppose they have me thar? I'd rather go to torment and get away from master and missus. I had so, she said, as with her usual groan. She got her basket on her head and walked sullenly away. Tom turned and walked sorrowfully back to the house. In the court he met little Eva, a crown of tuberoses on her head, and her eyes radiant with delight. "'Oh, Tom, here you are. I'm glad I found you. Papa says you may get out the ponies and take me in my little new carriage,' she said, catching his hand. "'But what's the matter, Tom? You look sober.' "'I feel bad, Miss Eva,' said Tom sorrowfully. But I'll get the horses for you." "'But do tell me, Tom, what is the matter? I saw you talking to cross old Prue." Tom, in simple earnest phrase, told Eva the woman's history. She did not exclaim or wonder or weep as other children do. Her cheeks grew pale, and a deep earnest shadow passed over her eyes. She laid both hands on her bosom and sighed heavily. End of chapter 18 and volume 1